This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome, and thanks for tuning in. It is a great honor to bring our show to Montana Public Radio. For many years, Brian Kahn had a show called Home Ground that aired in this time slot. Brian was a master at engaging difficult topics through conversation as a way to bring us all closer together. Here at A New Angle, we aspire to honor Brian's legacy and bring you conversations you can learn from. Today's conversation is with Conrad Anker. We are the first generation to completely understand the effects of anthropogenic climate change and quite possibly could be the last generation to create effective change. So every day we dilly-dally the effect in 40 years would be a lot more profound. Conrad is a legendary mountaineer and leader in the outdoor community. He's climbed some of the hardest routes on the most notorious mountains around the world, from Everest to Antarctica. Conrad is also a mentor, philanthropist, and activist. In particular, he's working to raise the volume on the climate crisis, along with his colleagues at Protect Our Winters, a nonprofit working to protect the places we love from the effects of climate change. And Conrad's had a front row seat to climate change in his many years traveling to wild landscapes significantly altered by warmer temperatures, more extreme weather, and many other factors. Conrad is also a Montanan. He and his family live in Bozeman and are actively engaged in the Montana community. Conrad wants all of us who enjoy wild spaces and nature to be more mindful of the climate when we do. I talked with Conrad in November. It was a great honor to spend some time with him, and I'm excited for you to hear our conversation right now. Conrad, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Justin, and uh, it's a real honor to be on your show. Right before we started recording, you, you had made the comment that this has been probably the most politically engaged time of your life. Um, one of the motivations for this conversation is the importance of the issue of climate to you, your work with Protect Our Winters. Having had such a long and prolific career in the mountains and in wild spaces, when did climate kind of arrive on your radar screen as something you, you started thinking about? Probably the first inclination of heat and climate was it, probably where my grandmother and grandfather had a small restaurant and and their place in central California, my brother and sister are still there. Both my parents have passed away. But I remember sitting one time there and watching a car pull up at the top of the grade and was overheating and it was just, you know, the radiator exploded and the car was just, and it was a common thing. It, you know, it's a steep 2000 foot elevation gain. It's just hard on vehicles. And, <laughs> and then looking at the asphalt and the heat there. And I was like, every time one of these engines heats up, it, it warms up. And so that was um, kind of this understanding of warming when I was a teenager, but um, it came into being in the, um, when I started mountain climbing and to go into alpine climbing and with trips to Alaska. So a lot of um, the research that you do prior to an expedition is um, looking previous expeditions to arrange where they climbed, what they'd done. Um, and um, going all the way back to the Torricella in the 1890s, there's photographic record of climbing expeditions on the mountains. And um, so in seeing the change that um, places in Alaska, um, the Himalayas, the Karakoram, and routes that when they were established, they had a mass of ice on them. And then subsequently, they were not um, climbable at all. And two specific mountains. One was the Ogre, um, which uh, Doug Scott was famously rescued off with broken ankles and one of the greatest epic stories of survival. And the route that they climbed is is no longer in existence. It's completely melted off. And there's recently exposed granite there, which is um, not optimal for climbing. And then the other one was Chilatse in the Kumbu Himal. And there, the, the, the Firn line, where the ablation of a glacier, um, where it accumulates above and it and it um, dissipates melts below had moved up 3,000 feet 1,000 meters and wow. repeating a route that a uh, 
Trilatse, which was by climbed by Vern Clavenger, Dylan Rowell, and John Ross Kelly. And we went to go climb it in 2005. And it was the same sort of story that happened on the Ogre, that there, um, the, the ice had just it melted away. And there was a recently exposed uh, rock on there. And in a similar way, looking at permanent snow fields here in Montana, one of the ways we can look at the stability of talus fields and how long rock has been exposed is the size of the lichen. And when you're in these mountain ranges in Absorkes and you come across an area and, you, and it's like, wow, that place had a permanent snow field up until recently because just on this aspect over here, there's a centuries old lichen and then here there's absolutely nothing and that had had a snow field on it. So all these small indications that by dint of being passionate about climbing, I was seeing the changes in the mountains. And what effect is that having on on you? I mean, you're seeing some of it through your research, but as you mentioned before, whether it's, you know, in, in the Absorkes or in Nepal or in Antarctica, like places you're traveling to again and again with, with longer intervals in between, like how, how is this sort of affecting your relationship to these re- landscapes and how you're thinking about them? The... Well, I'm a mountaineer, so I'm the ears of the mountains. That's a silly joke. It's a pun. Yeah. <laughs> a full dad-worthy joke. So. Well done. <laughs> yeah, so we, we're, we're the eyes and ears of the mountains. And, and climbing in the mountains, yeah, we'll be straight up. It's selfish. It's ego-driven. It doesn't, it's not like we're becoming better scientists or doctors or computer technicians or anything like that. We're going up there for, for our own enjoyment, recreation, rejuvenation, and ideally on a towards one's self-actualization of like what you really want to do in sure. in life. And so, yeah, climbing is great. It's fun, but it's, it's giving us a, a measuring stick. We are the canary in the coal mine with climate change that's happening now. And whereas, yeah, the, if there might not be an ice route or the ice climbing season is shorter and we'll adapt to it, we'll have fun. Yeah. But it's, it's not like it's a major thing that, that a, a privileged white person like myself, male to boot, living in Montana, is like, oh, you don't get as many days skiing in there. Yeah. Right. Boo hoo. But we are seeing climate change, and the people that are affected by it are um, the people that aren't necessarily causing the level of CO2 increase. So, um, say for people in Bangladesh, the areas there that are affected by the typhoons and monsoons that come in, and they're quality of life. And so in places where there's seasonal flooding or Houston, Texas getting hit twice with a hurricane in one season, things like that, these are real tangible effects of what climate is. And if we experience it in our recreation, that's good, but it's still the effects affect more people around the world than what we think. And disproportionately, lower income communities, communities of color. And so in that sense, there's a responsibility on our part to address this. Absolutely. Have you, and I know it's been, you know, a year without a a trip to the Himalaya, but knowing how important that community and the Sherpa are, are to you, has there been any effects within, in those communities? Is it affecting their livelihood, their relationship to the land? It's, and so forth. In Nepal, there's not this societal question of is climate change real? It's like it's very real, and yeah, it's happening. Yeah, and Nepal is um, by the current definition a victim nation because they are not producing the CO two per capita that's causing climate change, but like the people of the Maldives, the people of Nepal that are in the Himalayas, they are going to be suffering the effects of it. So um, near-term prognosis is um, accelerated melting of glaciers. And those would then can uh, release more water. If the water leaves the mountains in a normal fashion, things are well, but the opportunity or the, the risk of glacial lake outburst floods. So where previous um, terminal moraines that were there from the 1850s or 14,000 or 20,000 years ago, those then fill up with water um, and then they're catastrophically released. Uh, released. So that would be um, an example of, of how in those areas. But there's also 
Most human observation of climate is anecdotal. Oh, it was warmer then, or at Thanksgiving, right. it always did this. And they bring us a, a connection to it, but it's not climate and weather are connected. Weather is what's happening today. Climate is a long-term um, understanding of it. And for a lot of the, the people in the villages, they, they see these changes and there is a connection to atmospheric CO2. And so they, they're like, climate change is real. What can we do on our part to help mitigate the challenges? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the conservation space in general has been an area, and particularly in this sort of unique form of purple that Montana occupies, it's, it's been an area where left and right can kind of come together and, and share some common objectives for how to be better stewards of, of, of the land. Talk about your perspective on that, particularly here in Montana. Yeah, so Theodore Roosevelt was given a, a large credit, a large amount of credit for the creation of the national park system, and then his um, deep belief in the rugged life and getting outdoors and the benefits of that. And then under President Nixon, we had the Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. Um, so both of those are instances where people are with that. And Montana is interesting in that voters here our access to public lands and the quality of life that brought us to Montana and that keeps us here is of great importance. And so for many of the citizens of Montana, public lands is their single issue voting. I encourage people not to be single issue voters about any one thing and to be look at it from a holistic and from everything that's in there, um, civil rights to um, economic opportunity um, and, and how we treat people, um, and then including that in the environment. But that within Montana, that outdoors is such a part of our fabric that it, it spills over into the political process. Gosh, I mean, we should also mention that, you know, the, the, the sort of history of, of the white man's relationship to the land here is fraught in, in many ways. And then you layer on top of that this notion of, you know, Montana's history as a as a state built on an extraction economy, now maybe transitioning to a state sort of built more on a tourism economy. You know, when you think about climate and conservation, environmental activism, I mean, one of the the tools you can use to bring people into understanding the importance of these issues is getting them out there. In wild spaces. Yet getting more people out in wild spaces puts more stress on the resource. And so there's this, this balancing act. And then it's sort of a, a conversation about privilege. Well, just because I've been recreating in this space my whole life doesn't mean it's any more mine than somebody that's never been here before and wants to, to check it out and, and, and come to the party as well. How do you kind of think about those trade-offs with regard to you know, getting this message about the importance of climate out there, but also being mindful of the, the impacts that getting more people out will have. Being outdoors is good for humans. It's good for our soul. It's a great way to recuperate. And just being on a trail and being out of our oversubscribed plastic, steel, glass, rectilineal, concrete world, we get to be in nature and we we come back rejuvenated and um, it's uh, whenever I see someone out recreating, I smile, I say hello to them. I'm glad people are out there having a good time. So <laughs> I think now after COVID, we realize that connecting with other people is part of the human experience too. And whether you were to go to a concert or a stadium game, being in that space with those other humans is an affirmation of your being and your humanity. And in that same sense, if we look at seeing other people outdoors, that they uh, affirm our presence on this planet. Yeah, that connection with other people is such an important thread. And it seems like it's been such an important thread in your life as well. Some of these just high profile expedition experiences you've had those are really where deep relationships and friendships and trust uh, are forged through some shared suffering. Maybe talk about that a little bit. How have you come to connect with other people 
um, more deeply through your experiences in these wild places? Being outdoors is participatory. So if we go outside for our, our walk this afternoon or your run, you're doing it yourself. You're not plugging into the media machine to watch a basketball game, which I enjoy watching and I love sports. And But it's about going out and, and doing that experience. And so if Justin, you and I were to climb together and hopefully get a chance to do that one of these days, that when we tie into the rope, we are a team. And our adversary is, number one, gravity. Number two, the cliff that we're climbing on, the feature of the rock, the type of rock. And we have the weather to layer on there. And throughout all of this, we have this connection that your belaying me, your trust of me is what I need to enjoy nature. And so that connection that you have to trust another person in the outdoor space is, is priceless. And that is one of the good messages in that why people, when they when there is challenges, where there are ways that are, that are difficult, that they, they seek solace in the outdoors. And um, we'll use Camp David as an example outside of Washington, D.C., where here we have a retreat that the president could bring world leaders in that didn't have the the structure and the authority of the of Washington DC and the regulation and, and all of that, but rather it was outdoors. And you can imagine them having a campfire and s'mores and then going for a walk in the Sidious Hardwood Forest there and, and talking about Mid East peace and, and doing those things. And that even something as simple as walking outdoors, you're watching out for the person you're there. I mean there could be a bear that jumps out of the trees or something like that, or a tree could fall down. There is some bit of risk that sure. makes you connect to another human. And I think that's a, a good thing. You know, something you said in there, um, you talked a little bit about risk and that's a, that's something I've, I've wanted to ask you for a while is, you know, this relationship to risk and how it's sort of, it's gotta be part of the attraction in some ways to climbing. Um, but you're doing this with other people and you've sort of confronted risk on so many levels. It's kind of a constant, but you've also had loss of, of your mentors, of peers, of people you've been a mentor to, like, how, how do you kind of grapple with the concept of risk both in the moment and then over the, over the arc of a lifetime in, in, in the wilderness? We go climbing and it's obviously we're putting ourselves in a more dangerous place. I mean, we could minimize all the risk and not go outdoors, but being outdoors where you have to perform. So if you make a mistake climbing, gravity doesn't, there's no, you don't get a, a boogie shot or whatever, a bogey shot and a makeover. It's like, no, gravity is going to just accelerate till you land at the bottom of the mountain and you're dead. And so, yeah, I've become far too too much of that as you mentioned my mentors yeah. um my peers and my the people that i've um my mentees and all of that is in there that I've, I've lost that and there's danger which is a threat to our existence so identifying danger and then we evaluate that to see what the risk is what is the risk of that danger event happening to an individual. And for myself, my factory setting at birth was hyperactive, wired, um, sure. ADHD, just, you know, it was crazy. I, second grade was a, a challenge trying to, <laughs> to, like all this data come streaming into my mind and I didn't have a to-do list or I hadn't uh, been outdoors. And so my parents were like, okay, no medication. More time outdoors, less sugar. That was there. Yeah, just run this guy hot. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go outdoors until you're so tired that you lay down. So that was, um, and I'm thankful for them because it, it set me on the right path. And it was um, rather than a pharmacological solution to a ch child's hyperactivity that was getting outdoors. And that trait of being hyper situationally aware is what has kept me alive in the mountains. So all that data that was screaming for my attention. Now when I'm outdoors, I'm listening to the snowpack. I'm I'm observing the snowpack. I'm making a decision whether I will ski that run given the amount of data that I have in there. And so the same thing applies when you're climbing, that all of a sudden when you're 
on a rock climb and you're you have to how do I hold on to that handhold for optimum and not fall off? Then the rest of this stuff we call life, the your mortgage payment that's due on the fifth of each month and <laughs> COVID crisis, all that, it doesn't, it's like, it's gone. You are yeah, living in the moment. And in that sense, it's sort of this active meditation that gives us um, uh, some somewhere to go in life. We'll be back to our conversation with Mountaineer Conrad Anker after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. I'm Larry Summers, Harvard President Emeritus and former Treasury Secretary. You're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with mountaineer and climate activist Conrad Anker about what he's learned during a lifetime in the mountains. So let's shift gears back to, to climate a little bit. I want to just call out uh, more explicitly, Protect Our Winters, an organization that, you, that you're affiliated with. There are so many groups doing important work with climate, with the environment. Uh, how did Protect our, our Winters arrive on your radar screen? And why did you make the choice to, uh, to affiliate with this great organization? Yeah, Jeremy founded it, I believe, 2007. So. Um, and then 2011, he invited me to be on the board. We went and climbed Denali together. And so we'd been friends and acquaintances. And so, but it's been a wonderful opportunity and great organization to see it grow to where it is. A wonderful group of colleagues that I'm on the board of directors with that really um, make it worthwhile. And the beautiful part of this is that we are able to communicate with the 18 to 30 year old um, outdoor recreation person they're passionate about being outdoors whether it's trail running skiing hiking being outdoors is their reason of living and comes back to why we live in montana that same conversation a little bit earlier and with protect our winners we're showing this group of people that are outdoor enthusiasts here's the science this is what climate change is these are some experts that can help you talk about it and we're encouraging them to talk about it. We're giving them permission to talk about it. We're giving them the responsibility to talk about it. And we're giving them the tools to talk about it. And that whole process of civic engagement has been, it's been a lot of fun to see how it's grown and that there's Protect Our winter, Winters chapters that have sprouted up volunteer chapters in, in, in Europe and in Asia just on their own because people are like, this message resonates with sure. our community. We want to help out. And so there's, um, I think the more voices that team together that are climate aware, then the better off we are. And Greta Thunberg and her work in the last uh, couple of years as a young person has been, has been a great, it's been great to see that for, um, for children, young adults of that age to be like, wow, here's some, I can do this too. And they're dedicated to it. And it's not something that's abstract. This is something that's going to affect this, the future of, of these young people's lives. Yeah. How would you advise people hearing this or just people in general who, who, who sort of feel compelled to, to maybe want to try to get involved in this space? I mean, what, what should, what first step should people take? The initial step is, um, is is living a purposeful life. So doing what you can to minimize your travel, um, re, you know, being mindful of the, the type of food you consume and, and its impact on the planet um, and doing the best you can recycling. And we, we get that and we're moving towards that. But the way our economy functions and the market externalities that are beneficial and detrimental to both the carbon industry and the renewable industry are the result of legislative action. So to get the ball moving and to get the flywheel of innovation under foot and to get ideas going, we need market externalities that support 
renewable energy and climate awareness. And the only way we can work that out is through the ballot box. I mean, we are a democracy. And so having leaders that identify these as a as an existential as an existential threat to humanity, both in the near term, and I'll use near term as 40 years, in the long term as in 200 years, having those type of elected officials will help us sustain the health of this planet. We have to save the planet so we can save humanity and finding that balance between a carbon intensive lifestyle, which we all live and we're all guilty of and we're all living the benefit and to make that transition to a a less impactful lifestyle. And, so, and that whole transition is happening as we speak. And we, as the saying is, we are the first generation to completely understand the effects of anthropogenic climate change and quite possibly could be the last generation to create effective change. So Every day we dilly-dally here in 2020, the effect in 40 years would be a lot more profound. And so the way I look at this from a climber's standpoint, a metaphor analogy, if we will, and it's like, well, yeah, I always get up early and I'm like, get going earlier than everyone says, oh, we're going to start at three. I'm like, well, let's start at two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it drives my climbing partners nuts, but they all know that's my mo and yep. because 15 minutes in, in the morning at the dark can be an hour in the evening when you're tired and late and getting ahead of things like that so that preparedness is something that um, we need to bring into a into a societal perspective conrad it's been a pleasure i've enjoyed learning more about your worldview your your, your approach to life and uh great thanks for spending some time with us today and thank you justin and um even though we're three hours and 15 minutes away from each other from missoula to bozeman we're in the same state and um i can't wait to meet up with you and go for a trail run and um yeah may the the anxiety of the where we are right now in 2020 and the stress that a global pandemic has created um Let's collectively use this as a way to look at life through a purpose-driven perspective of what is important to us and how we interact with our fellow humans. And that's, um, there's, whenever there's something challenging or difficult, there's, there's, a, there's a lesson in there. We just have to be open to understanding it and seeing it and listening to it. Absolutely. That's well put. Thank you, Conrad. Justin, thank you. And thanks listeners for tuning in. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums, Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer. BTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.